welcome to um, Amazon Economics and Columbia Business School. I'm glad uh, to see so many of you here during, I guess, Super Bowl of, um, of climate change, right? The World Cup, that's COP. This is the Super Bowl version, uh, New York City Climate Week. Um, so my name is Gernot Wagner. I'm a climate economist here at Columbia Business School. Um, and I'm very glad to have exactly three jobs. Welcome all of you and thank the Tema Center for hosting this amazing event. Um, second job is to guide us through the evening and make sure we end on time to leave time for the reception, commencing at, hold me accountable to this, 7.45 p.m. We'll be upstairs in the third floor boardrooms for this. Um, and my third job is to introduce the first speaker, um, Eleanor Shevliakova from the Geophysics Fluid Dynamics Lab, GFDL, at Princeton, who will start us off with the academic portion of today. So we'll have two parts, um, two academic talks, introductions, and then a policy panel with a lively discussion, hopefully with all of you. Um, so thank you. Take it away. I don't know. How do I change? Yes. Hi. Here we go. Um, so I'm going to be bearer of the bad news because I'm a climate modeler and we study climate change and how that might affect the world and Amazon in particular. And my hope is by understanding how bad it could be, we could find solutions of how we could actually prevent it and save the Amazon and the world from all this bad news. Okay, we all know that world under multiple threats, Amazon in particular, we have rising temperatures, frequent intense droughts, deforestation, frequent wildfires. How do we know what might happen in the future? We use as climate models. And somebody asked me, how would you describe a climate model? I think one could think about a weather model on steroids running a marathon. And the reason I said that, because unlike, we use similar equations and the simple, similar computers and parameterizations in a climate model that, as the weather model uses in US or elsewhere. But we run those models not just from today for two weeks, we run them from pre-industrial time, sometimes even earlier, into the future to 2100. And the way the models work, you take the world, you break it into little boxes, which we call grids or resolution, and in each of those boxes, you. Uh, prescribe or compute concentration of greenhouse gases, CO2, for example, or other forcing aging like dust and water vapor, which is a main greenhouse gas. You apply hydrological, energetic, biogeochemical relationship, and you compute how the uh, air moves, your dynamics, and what are the processes by which clouds are formed, rain falls around, what happened to the ocean, what happened to the land. And when we project things in the future, we don't predict, we project. We get a stories from scientists like in this building, economists, uh, social scientists, demographers about what population could be like, what kind of economists might have, what kind of technologies they might have, and how those changes might affect emissions of greenhouse gases and concentrations. And then we tell them what would be the weather like in the future over the 100 years, temperatures, precipitation, winds, and other factors, and how that affects the land. So, and usually when you look at the future, you don't want to trust just one model, right? You want to have some ensembles or some collection of models. And unfortunately, to addition, in addition to the world's getting warmer, many places actually getting drier. Particularly for Amazon, you see in this plot, which shows projections from present day to 2100, from 19 models from major climate centers, the precipitation is declining in Amazon. In, 19 out of, in 18 out of 90 models, and on average, actually, the same. And you could see that you know, the declines are very consistent among them. It's not a good news. If you think that projections you know, showing you that precipitation is going to decline, you might going to ask a question, what are going to happen to the forests in Amazon? And for this type of model questions, we use so-called Earth system models. Earth system models, are, you can think about as your physical climate models, which are connected to carbon cycle, and they include models of biosphere. At my lab, at GFDL, and it's like a big lab, it's not a little lab, it's about 150 people, we developed a model called LM4.1, and it includes very advanced representation of what's happened 
subgrid. Subgrid means inside of that box. It can look at the redistribution of the land use, crops, pastures, forests. It looks at the effect of increased atmospheric CO2 on the how plants grow, so-called CO2 fertilization, also in climate feedback. If you change the forest, it's also changed the atmosphere because it transpired different amount if reflective surfaces change. We also have daily model of fire. And that's one of the major things which affect carbon cycle, both because of the climate changes, but because of the human activities. And as a result, then we compute distribution of different type of trees, grasses, and how they compute for light. So in the end of all this process, you have forest emerging in these models purely by knowing like how the physics and climate and water works. So they predict future forests, not just prescribe them. So in one of these studies led by my former postdoc, Isabel Martinez Cana, we asked the question, if precipitation is going to change in time, not just in place, what's going to happen between you know, distributions in distributions of grasslands, savannas, and forests. And scientists know for a long time. Then you have more precip, you have more forests, and you have very little precip, you have grasslands. But if precipitation changes in time, not just in space, the question is like how quickly those places, like as precipitation declines, would become grassland, and if they, we reverse the climate change, would they go back? This is so-called hysteresis. <laughs> And the major play in these models in this kind of question is fire, because fire can quickly kill a lot of forests, and it also can prevent forests from establishing by, you know, coming very quickly in a system like grasslands, which have a lot of fuel. So in this study, what Isabel did, she looked at uh, over the Amazon, at every that grid point, and the scenario, it's so-called SSP 8.5. This is a bit almost like business as usual scenario, very low mitigation. And she asked a question, so if she looks at each of those points in Amazon, those green boxes where the forests are present, would they remain, remain forest or they turn into the grasslands? And unfortunately, what she find out from present day to 2100, many of those points, those are purple lines, it's a, you know, the vertical axis is biomass that went from being forest to something more like a savanna or, or a grassland. So basically climate change itself gonna promote more frequent fires. You see the frequency of those little orange like um, uh, things. Those are like frequency of fires happening during that period in Amazon. And as you see, like as you go into future, the model get drier, the model get drier, you have more fires and more forests are killed and they're not establishing back. So, and as a result, you have increase in the carbon emissions going back into atmosphere. It's very unfortunate scenario, and we hopefully it wouldn't happen. So we could also ask a different question. If you have changes in Amazon, how is it gonna affect regional or global climate? And it's probably less known that the climate will change, that by changing land itself, you can actually dampen or enhance the climate change. There are so-called land feedbacks to the climate system. So we tried to conduct other experiments where we tried to ask a different question. Imagine in our virtual laboratory that we will go basically and remove the forest. We make them all into the pasture and what will happen in the future. So unlike previous experiments done by Carlos Nombre in Brazil, we use uh, emission driven simulations. We didn't fix the atmospheric concentration like most of scenarios do. We computed them interactively by exchanging the carbon fluxes between biosphere, land, in an ocean and atmosphere. So atmospheric CO2 concentration is actually predicted in those models. So, and we can look at two different scenarios. So-called ambitious, SSP1, which is also known as a Paris Agreement scenario because under that scenario, you could actually stay under, under 1.5 degree. And a baseline where you don't do much of the mitigation, SSP5. And those scenarios also include not just concentrations of greenhouse gases, or emissions of greenhouse gases, but also land use. How much pasture, how much crop people could have under certain assumption of the technology and the population growth. And we replace tropics with either, tropical forests with either 100% or 50% of pasture. So it's not a bare land. It has something, but it's not trees. And we compare averages around the mid-century, 2040 to 260, to pre-industrial. When people tell you, tell you about climate change, warming, they always refer to 1850 because that's considered like onset of this in, in, increase in emissions. And we didn't deforest the whole South America, we just did like a square domain. So, and by the way, this is like a depiction of what these scenarios look like. So, and I'm showing here not the greenhouse gas concentrations, which we usually hear, but also what's happening to land use. So under this Paris Agreement scenario, there's an assumption that there's a major decrease in the pasture lands in South America. Croplands are going a little bit up, 
and the four is kind of staying about the same, right? They assume that, but there's gonna be some major reduction. Pasture land in Amazonia, in order to meet that, you know, you know, uh, demand for afforestation, reforestation, and bioenergy. And under uh, taking the highway, the usual scenario, or business as usual scenario, you pretty much sort of like don't reduce your pasture land. You have some reductions in forest and you have increase in the croplands. So, and what happened in that simulation? So again, we're looking at average over 30, year, 30 years between, no, 40 years, between 2040 and 60. And we're focusing on South America right now. SSP1, it's a Paris Agreement in the left and in the middle. And this is temperature change. Dark brownish colors are about two degrees and like dark blues are about minus two. And you could see if you remove that forest in that simulation, and even under Paris Agreement scenario, you're gonna have a big warming over the Amazon. I think that's what I've been warned about and they're gonna fix it in the back. It's not against my time, right? <laughs> okay, great. So if somebody reduces 50% of forest, and we do that once, like at the present day, so you basically still have substantial reductions around like one degree in some places in Amazon. And under 50% scenario on the right, you pretty much, with the higher atmospheric CO2 concentrations, you have very high values as well. I can't see that, okay, it's fine, I'm gonna, I don't see it on my screen, but it's okay. So, it's okay, we'll get there. But what also we found very surprising, that it's not just the temperature effect, which is kind of natural because you reduce transpiration in the simulation, you, you know, change the albedo, but you see that a reduction of forests lead to changes in evapotranspiration in those regions, increased runoff, and as a result, you have local feedback on precipitation, and there is a major decrease, up to two millimeters a day, in the precipitation when you remove all or even like a half of the forest. You don't remove them, you replace them with, with, with the pastures. And under low mitigation scenarios, even 50% reduction in the forest also produces around like one to one and a half degree precipitation decrease, which would be devastating for the forest themselves. It would be devastating for hydropowers because there are changes in stream flow. I'm not showing here where they exist. So, but if you go now and ask uh, the question, so we're basically finding out that 100% deforestation produces large, up to two and a half degree warming and extensive reduction precipitation on the ambitious scenario under Paris Agreement. So if we lose Amazon, if everybody else thinks they're doing great, unless like Brazil and other countries are gonna be really affected. 50% of deforestation produces about a half of the effect compared to 100%, and 50% of deforestation in the baseline produces a more warming and more precipitation reduction in the you know, usual scenario than under ambitious scenario. Okay, so what happened globally? Uh, what we find in this simulation, since we're actually conserving all the carbon and whatever we deforest goes back into atmosphere and you're keeping this precipitation, you're not allowing land to take back that carbon, the global CO2 concentration go up by 30 ppm, the global temperature increased by quarter degree, and there is less likely that we could keep the Paris Agreement scenario in place and keep it under 1.5 degrees since pre-industrial because of so much CO2 not just goes into atmosphere but actually is not taken back. Because I don't know if people are aware of that, only half of fossil fuel emissions remain atmosphere after being emitted, half goes, like half of that remainder goes into land and another half goes into ocean. So you, and Amazon is a major storage and a sink for the CO2. If there are precipitation changes, as we showed it, mostly around the South America, there is a little bit of teleconnections to the western coast of US. That feature showed up, not just in our model, but in other models as well. So, and uh, in summary, I would say that if we don't have Amazon, it will result in substantially warmer and drier Amazonia. If you wouldn't have tropical forest in Amazonia, the whole region would become warmer and drier under both ambitious and baseline scenario due to regional biophysical feedbacks. And it'd be less likely that the world as a whole will reach Paris Agreement, including stabilizing climate at 1.5 degree. So, and I would like to say thank you to my colleagues at GFDL, uh, Isabella, who is now at Barcelona, 
and Steve Pakala, my mentor, and my <coughs> colleagues at JBL. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jose Schenkman, I'm a professor of economics here at Columbia. And what I'm gonna to talk today is based on a paper with Juliano, who's sitting out there, Juliano Assunção from the Climate Policy Initiative and the PUC Rio, Lars Hansen, who is at the University of Chicago, and Todd Munson, who is a computational scientist at Argonne National Lab. So, we know that the Amazon produces 9%, only 9% of the GDP is a small portion of Brazil, but almost 50% of the emissions of Brazil come from the Amazon, mostly as a result of deforestation. <clears throat> so historically, we deforest an area of the size of Texas. Brazilians don't really know what the size of Texas is, but for the American audience, I find it always impresses. <laughs> so, Almost 90%, if you take the deforested area, a large part has been simply abandoned, maybe a quarter. But 90%, which, is not been, which has not been abandoned, is used for low productivity cattle production. And that's very important, the word low productivity is very important. Now the workers in this industry make around $300 a month, and the vast majority is informal, they have no, no labor rights which means deforestation has not resulted in poverty alleviation. You know, the Brazilian, especially the military ideology was gonna occupy the Amazon, you're gonna be rich. What you've seen, we've occupied the Amazon and increased poverty or cause a lot of poverty in that region, okay? So, so is the question that we, 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 we analyze in this, in this paper is, a very straightforward one. How does the price of carbon affect the optimal choice between, between extensive cattle grazing, that is what we have now, and, deforest and reforestation? Now, to answer this question, and this is the academic side, that's for the graduate students around here that may be interested in something like that, uh, needs the understanding of the productivity of the cattle industry and the dynamic of carbon accumulation in the Amazon. It also requires, because the Amazon, we think of the Amazon as a homogeneous body, but it's not. It's very heterogeneous. It's heterogeneous both in the capacity of capturing carbon as trees grow, the amount of carbon capture, which is of course related to that too, but also differs of productivity of cattle grazing. So that makes it necessary to do analysis at a kind, of, at a kind of a spatial, combine a spatial and a dynamic analysis at the same time. Okay, so he, I'm gonna start with the answers and then tell you why the answers are what they are. If there are no transfers, okay, if Brazil continues to value carbon as in the past, the Amazon would release 30 gigatons of tax of carbon in the next 30 years. You know, that's just the economic path. Now, Elena didn't, Elena, Elena's point, that's about 30% of the Amazon being deforested. Uh, that's not at the range that Elena talked, but you know, continuity holds on those, some of those things. So there's at least a substantial risk of a tipping point. On the other hand, if you just transfer $20 per ton of CO2, Brazil would, would be optimal for Brazil to substantially reforest and actually capture 16 gigatons of CO2 in the next 30 years. Now these transfers amount to $320 billion, you know, 16 times 20, that's the number. Um, but, and this would take into account, and I'll talk about that, how much Brazilians actually value climate services and the, uh, and these transfers, that would amply compensate for the loss of the cattle industry income. Over time, these transfers are kind of an inverted U. That's not an exact picture. It's more like it goes up fast, and then it goes down slowly, you know, back to zero as, the, as all the forest matures. But in the peak, it exceeds $15 billion a year. 
Now, Andrea, who is into these negotiations, you know, we had the Americans offer 500 million for the forestation program. So the scale is very different in what's needed to, step, to do something like this, and that's important. Now, if you were to transfer $25 a ton, then the transfer payments by themselves, even if Brazilians don't value the forest at all, will be enough to compensate the cattle industry loss. Now, these payments from abroad are going to reflect net capture of greenhouse, greenhouse house gases. So they should be compared with prices what's paid in Europe for net capture, which is about $90 a ton. So, Andrea, you have a very good space to bargain. <laughs> Between 20 and 90, uh, you could get a lot more. So, and you also should count on the follow. Although this program, the payments is all for, for actual carbon capture, in fact, we're gonna stop the current path of deforestation. So the net changes is 46 gigatons in total, total over 30 years. Now, if you think about it, you know, those numbers are very, certainly not exact, and, but people talk about numbers. What does it take to give us a 50% chance of not going over one and a half degrees? And from the numbers I saw in 2012, discounting what was put already the last couple of years, in 20, I'm sorry, 2021, and then what's been put up in the last couple of years, that's about 10% of that, of that amount. You know, maybe we have 450 gigatons left, maybe we have 500, maybe we have 400, okay? So that makes the effective cost of carbon much lower because in fact you're paying for 16 but getting a gain of 46. So you have to divide by more than two to go to the effective cost. Now, here's how you get to the answer. You get to the answer, the first thing you have to construct the spatial dynamic optimization model that considers a trade-off between greenhouse gas emissions and income from agriculture. And of course, the auto solution depends on the price of, emis of emissions. Um, and then we do the following calculus. Looking what Brazil has done, okay? How much, what justifies what happens in Brazil? What price of carbon? would have said it's optimal what Brazil did, and you come up with a number $5 a ton. So at least historically, that's how Brazilians have implicitly valued, okay? Um, it's $5 a ton. So now you can use this $5 a ton to calculate the business as usual trajectory, so suppose there are no transfers, Brazil will continue to evaluate at $5 a ton, but also calculate the value for Brazilians of the changing climate change. And then what we do, we consider adding transfers of $5, of $15, $20, whatever you want. Okay, you can do, put whatever number you want to recalculate what would happen optimally under those, after those transfers. And one thing we do very carefully, I won't talk about this, is treat uncertainty um, in a careful way. A part of it is that not only we have uncertainty about the future, but also have uncertainty about the current state. We don't really know for sure what are the, tree, the tree's growth capacity for carbon. We have estimates, you know, and its distribution. We don't really know for sure what is cattle productivity in these different areas. We have estimates, okay? And we treat that very, very carefully. And also there's a big numerical computation of challenge because you're going for over 30 years and over a thousand different strips in the Amazon. So, here's the, this is what you get. Those are the trajectory of deforestation. On orange, it is the business as usual story. At $5 a ton, no transfers, transfers are zero. And what Brazil would do is that they would continue to deforest and in, in about 30 years, we be close to 30% of the forest deforested, okay? You go from 15 today to 30. However, as soon as you have transfers, it becomes rational for Brazil to start uh, lowering the deforestation, in fact, reforesting, okay? And that's what happens when you give $10, when you give $15, or you give $20. This curve's always a line. If you wanna know where $25 is, it's below the $20 somewhere. Now, 
Not all those trajectories are good enough for Brazil because the losses from agriculture could be higher than the transfer you get. And that's why we concentrate in this, at least this $20 margin. So that's the trajectory of carbon accumulation, okay? Um, you continue to accumulate in all the trajectory except for zero transfer. For zero transfer, the amount of carbon captured in the Amazon is going to substantially decrease, maybe by 30%. And that's the evolution over these different areas, OK? So the first map to the left, top to the left, tells you what is the current situation, OK? Current situation, most agriculture, most cattle, I talk, use the word agriculture broadly. You know, it's mostly cattle grazing. It's mostly concentrated at the boundary of the Amazon, the southern boundary and the eastern boundary. And what we'd like to do is, over time, you know, bring this, this, the forest back. And you start bringing back, for, you know, first the regions which are not in that border region, then just the regions which are not in the, border, in the, in the eastern border of the Amazon, and you end up with basically zero. So that's the historical evolution over the next 30 years, okay? So I'm ready to conclude. I don't think I got a sign from you, but I'm ready to, I got three minutes, it's fine. I don't need three minutes. We can have more time for Q&A. So reforestation, so those are the points we want to make. First, reforestation in the Brazilian Amazon is able to generate substantial carbon capture in the next 30 years at a low cost. Now, these 30 years are crucial years, of course, because maybe in 30 years, we're going to have Bill Gates' magic machine, and we won't need any more the forest, you know? Um, the result also probably extend to other tropical forests. Uh, Indonesia is a place that has had an experience much like the Brazilians. They deforest quite a bit. Parts of Latin America, which have the Amazon forest, which is probably the second tropical forest in the world, is Amazon X Brazil, the largest uh, is Brazilian Amazon and then Amazon X Brazil. Some of these countries have also had experienced substantial deforestation. And it's very important this study completely ignores other benefits from reforestation. Biodiversity, safeguarding Brazil's current rain regime, Elena talked about that. You know, Brazil is one of the most productive areas for agriculture on Earth. And it is about that because they have a very good rain regime. That region is just south of the Amazon. And as soon as this region is affected, we're going to have enormous losses in this very productive area, both for cattle and for soybeans and for corn, et cetera. You know, it also ignores the externality generated by reforestation on one side on other sides. Each side is treated as an independent entity. Okay? And we have a recent study with Rafael Araújo, who is a young Brazilian economist, very talented Brazilian economist. Juliana is part of the team. Marina Hiroto is a very good climate scientist in Brazil. Um, and we document that reforestation in one area causes damage in other areas, equivalent damage in other areas in the Amazon. On average, when you deforest an area of the Amazon, you lose forest cover in an equivalent amount spread over the Amazon. Okay. Thank you very much, and we're ready to go. What's that? I think I'd like to invite you and Elena to sit down. We're going to collect a, a couple of questions. Uh, I'm going to do two rounds of Q&A, and this one will be a bit shorter, about 10 minutes. So uh, if you have questions. I think there are some mics over there. Just raise your hand. Oh, there is one over there. Maybe you can do three and then pass to them. Thank you so much. What do you think is the best way to ensure offsets are actually permanent in the long term with forestation? Other one? Oh, there's another one. Okay. 
Hi, thank you so much for being here. I think my question is more in terms of implementing it. I understand that the $20 would be able to generate carbon capture, but do you account in this $20 transfer also the cost of security and how to protect the area, or would that be something separate in the transfer? Interesting. Lena, um, maybe it's worth mentioning that um, the Biden administration's estimates of the social cost of carbon is around about $200 a ton. So that, in other words, the damage done by the emission of one ton of carbon is roughly 200, was valued at roughly $200. And you can take, take this stuff out of the atmosphere for $20. That's a real bargain uh, in economic terms. Okay, thank you, Jeff. It's a very good point you made. We're trying to be, you know, modest on what the actual value is because, you know, but I agree with you. You know, we're, I think at this point, with the urgency we have, $200, it seems to be a, a reasonable evaluation. Um, so the question of, of how to enforce this is a very important question. The interesting thing, and Juliana has written about that, has a very interesting paper on that, is that Brazil has been very good at enforcing during a period. If you have the political will, enforcing is cheap. You can use satellite technology, you can use police, and what they did too was they would apprehend equipment, and since you were far from everybody, they just torched the equipment. Because, you know, deforestation is not done by a little guy with a machete. You can't do that in the Amazon, that's the illusion. You do it with big machines. And when you, when you simply arrest people doing the machines, you're getting some poor guys that were hired to do the job, you know? So you really have to destroy the equipment. So Brazil did that very well. I recommend the paper by Julian on the, on the topic. If you email him, he'll send you the uh, link to the paper. But, um, so we could do it again. Okay, the first thing the Bolsonaro did, they, they made it illegal for the police to destroy the equipment. That was enough to make basically people go back to the activities. Now, I think that's collected, actually. I don't think I need a separate answer to the question that came from here, because that's what we need to do. We need to have a form of enforcement, you know? And this form of enforcement it will have to come from the government. That's why I am a little bit skeptic of the possibility of the private sector by itself organizing something or doing a lot of stuff. We need government action on this. I mean, it's not going to work until the government is committed to both provide protection and also to... And as Elena was showing you, you know, we have this problem of fires. Now, there's literature, too, that when you have human activity, you get, not only you get fires from deforestation, you also, get defore, you also get fires simply from human activity that spreads. There's some good papers on this. And that indicates that that has to be done in massive areas. You know, you can't do in little areas because you still be subject to the same forces that cause, that cause fires, you know. One calculation I saw in a paper that 90% of the fires that they looked at were not intentional on the sense that these areas did not become deforested. They just got their capacity to retain, to, to grow trees and so on, got damaged. But there was no, apparently there was no intention to deforest the area. So it took a long time for the area to deteriorate, in fact. Thanks, Jose. Elena, please. I'm going to go from reverse, I'm going to start with Jeffrey's question. I actually was involved in terms of uh, damages. I just keep it closing. So basically, in this exercise of social cost of carbon, there is no original information. They use global models where everything costs the same everywhere, and it damages a square function of temperature. So in some sense, I think the price is high, but it doesn't mean 
it's a, it, it's once damages occur, right? But to prevent the damage, prices don't have to be two hundred dollars. So I think it's a difference between what happened when you create damage versus what you do to save their, you know, the same carbon stocks. But also, I think the difference in terms of what things cost to prevent those forest destruction in different countries is not necessarily tough. So I think there's a huge opportunity for private companies, for Brazilian government, for social NGOs to actually rally people towards saving Amazon. And I think it's not going to be one solution. It's probably going to be multiple solutions. And I'm sure Brazilians on the grounds and in the state governments in Brazil, they know like how to address these issues. So, but I think like this opportunity for us in academia in the Western world to give uh, information about what are the risks associated with the loss of Amazon and what are the opportunities and investments are there for many companies and for private for NGOs to actually save the forest, not just reforest, but avoid deforestation. So I think avoiding deforestation and making sure that population have sources of income is probably the best way to and engage them into reforestation. So thank you, Elena. So uh, I think that the, the bad news is that we are destroying a quite critical biome. But the good news is that we have the tools and it's relatively cheap in order to save it. Uh, we're going to come back uh, after the next section for another round of Q&A. But I'd like to pass to Gurner to organize a panel session on, on, on the policy where people will solve this problem for all of us. Why don't we simply turn it over to Ambassador Andre Curry Delago first, if you don't mind? So maybe to simply start with brief reactions, or essentially, what do we do with this information? And of course, also, you know, maybe not directly in the day-to-day -day political context, but Yes, what does one do with the science giving us a very clear answer, the economics for the matter giving us a very clear answer, and then there's the day-to-day -day politics. Okay. Well, good afternoon to all. I'm very happy. Well, we are so many here to discuss this. Um, well, I can, I can tell you what we've been trying to do since the new government started. Uh, I am. Um, I work at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I'm Secretary for Climate, Energy, and Environment. So <clears throat> we have now uh, a government that is uh, quite convinced that uh, the that it's a very bad business to destroy the Amazon. This, I believe, is something that is is very clear in the government. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there is uh, a huge debate in Brazil, uh, and most of you know that, uh, about if what is an international concern about Brazil is the same thing as the concern of Brazilians. And if you go down politically to the region, it becomes even more complicated because uh, uh, the majority of members of parliament, governors of the Amazon region are opposition of the Lula government. So they, they believe that this is an agenda that is imported because uh, it is against somehow a kind of uh, freedom uh, um, of, um, uh, let's say, development uh, in a traditional way. I think that there was enormous progress uh, in, in the economic thinking during uh, the Bolsonaro years. I believe that this agenda, uh, and uh, also not only the dimension of climate change, but also of biodiversity and uh, the knowledge also, for instance, of the issue uh, of, uh, of the rains, etc., it has grown enormously in recent years. Uh, and somehow we had the feeling that first you had the science, then you had the civil society, then you had politics, then you had business. Everybody was more or less convinced to enter this debate. 
And I think what was missing most was economics, because uh, somehow uh, uh, in Brazil, the Amazon is always treated as something uh, from left or from right, or something that, well, yeah, let's think about it later. It's there, etc. So, uh, so I think this discussion today is extremely important, and I have to say that we are relying very much on what uh, uh, Julian, or Alexandre, etc., are are working uh, to to develop a more intelligent policy there, but. Obviously, we have the political dimension. I am, in principle, a negotiator. So theoretically, I have to uh, work outside of Brazil. But the first step is to have an agreement of all the ministries in Brazil and all the institutions in Brazil on the position that Brazil is going to defend on the negotiation. So this is a very complex part uh, of the job because obviously the Ministry of Agriculture has different opinions, and the Ministry of Transportation has different opinions, and uh, obviously mines and energy, et cetera, et cetera. But I am very surprised, and that's good news. I have to bring some good news. The, the good news is that I feel uh, that on a technical level, there is an absolute agreement between all these ministries I mentioned that we can find a solution, uh, and we can work on a solution that can bring uh, uh, positive effects uh, in the Amazon, which will have very positive effects on basically everything. For you to have an idea, the, the Ministry of Agriculture of Brazil was taken to a supermarket in, uh, in the UK and uh, to be shown that in the supermarket it was written, we promise all our clients that none of the meat we sell comes from Brazil. So. So they are feeling that there are some consequences beyond uh, uh, simply the idea of, uh, of the burning of the ice. <clears throat> then we had an experience recently. You please tell me to, to keep quiet as, 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 as soon as you want. But I just want to tell you very uh, quickly that we, we had the first experience that was quite interesting during this government. First, obviously, that law and order were restored, as you were saying, and even with the institutions depleted by four years of a reduction of the number of people that work in the field, the reduction of the number uh, of uh, people that know about uh, the job, uh, and uh, uh, with all of that, there was a reduction of 48% of deforestation in eight months, which is quite remarkable. Now, we cannot rely only on law and order. We have to have an economic answer to all these people that live in this place, which are much less people than people think. Uh, the, the Amazon, uh, and they are very poor, they have the lowest uh, um, social indicators in Brazil. So it's the poorest area of Brazil, uh, and, but they still believe that this is the solution, this is how they are going to get rich, etc. But the, what we tried, apart from the, the working in the, in the field, uh, uh, we organized this um, meeting of all the, the, the Amazonic countries in Belém uh, three months ago, two months ago. And to prepare this meeting, it's eight uh, Amazonic countries plus a little part of Guyana that is French, but they are not part of the, of the association of countries of uh, the Amazon. Uh, and in the preparation, it was really very impressive because we had scientists, we had um, law enforcer, we had NGOs, we had local governments, we had many different people and business. And the number one problem for them in the Amazon is organized crime. So, organized crime. And, uh, and so we started to hear, we took all the list of the things that were the main concerns, and we tried to bring it to the Declaration of Belém that we got the eight countries uh, to sign. And, and I think that one of the great things that we, we achieved with the eight countries is that for the first time, I think, in probably, uh, we, we have the tipping point mentioned four times in the Declaration. So there is a recognition of science, there is uh, also the support to a central policing of the region. 
because the spillover is quite alarming. Um, Bolivia now has very high deforestation, and many of those that are deforesting in Bolivia are Brazilians, according to the federal police. Uh, and so it happens a bit around. So it's, it, we, we don't believe that Brazil can do the job well if all the biome is not dealt with. So I think th th that there are really great progress uh, from uh, an effective point of view and the knowledge of the issues and the recognition of the issues. Uh, and I think this is also another quite uh, special thing uh, and uh, Kevin knows that, he's also been for years a negotiator, is that normally countries never recognize their real problem. They love to point to other people's problems. No? Uh, and we are talking about our big problem. Our big problem is deforestation, as the numbers were put. So this is really a central uh, um, priority of the Lula government, and I believe that Politically, uh, we can deal with the fact that the local politics are more complicated, etc. Anyway, just to start. So, Andre, I believe you mentioned uh, Juliana first and then name-checked Kevin. So let me pick on uh, you first, Juliana. Uh, so Juliana Santiago, Executive Director of the Emergent Leaf Coalition. What is the pressure you're putting on the government to, or on everyone, to do more of what would otherwise happen. Yeah, uh, good night, uh, everyone. Thank you, Professor Jarnot, Professor Juliano, for the invite. Uh, first of all, the Leaf Coalition do not put any pressure. Uh, the Leaf Coalition has, has uh, come together to actually try to scale up financing to forest and to pay for results-based uh, uh, as the, the VARSO framework um, uh, has established. So uh, there is a, a um, like if we look for the Amazon in particular, in, 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 uh, and as, as Ambassador Andrea just mentioned, I think there are two dimensions in, in one, Ambassador, if you may, in addition to the financial incentives that I totally agree, and these are one of the pillars I believe has to, and, uh, uh, to be, uh, um, uh, uh, organized in a range, and that's one of the missions of the Leaf Coalition. The other one is public policy, as, as, as the ambassador also uh, explored. But there is also a, a, a need to consider what he just said, some data about the Amazon uh, in particular, that some, in some sense uh, replicates in other uh, tropical forest countries and territories. So there are people living in the forest in the Amazon region, although there, are there is a concentration in, in urban areas. There are 25 to 27 million inhabitants with a multiplicity of, of cultural uh, uh, backgrounds. So we have indigenous peoples, we have Quilombolas, we have rivaling uh, communities, uh, uh, extractivist-based uh, uh, populations, land uh, 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 reform settlers, uh, so it's a, it's a multiplicity of solutions to really address the, prob the social problems we have in the territory. The second thing, uh, as, as Ambassador also said, is to acknowledge the social and the poverty and inequality challenge we have in the region. So if we look to the Amazon region, the, the, the UN Human Development Index of the region is 0.68 as compared to 0.73 of the Brazilian average and 0.78 of the southern richest region of the country. So we have an H HDI issue and a, and, a, and a social deep problem in the region. And so the economic aspect of these, in addition to the, the multilateral uh, 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 fundraising strategies, you also have an internal, efficient public policy implementation issue to address these social problems. Uh, the third thing is about the, the social conflicts of the territory and to acknowledge that deforestation uh, is part of this social conflict we observe in the territory. And, and lastly, but not, not least, uh, we have to consider uh, what uh, Professor Elena just mentioned, that we are coming to the tipping point. And with, with all this, uh, uh, I would uh, 
I would uh, affirm these errors in public policy implementation, these incentives of occupying the Amazon and investing in infrastructure without really planning the territory. Uh, we, we've been seeing the Amazon coming from the 70, 1975 of 0.5% of deforestation in the territory to 20% nowadays and closing to a tipping point. Uh, but, but we had good results as well. If we look to Brazil in the gold years that we were able to reduce deforestation by 80% from 24, when actually a very important uh, public policy started to be implemented, that was the PPC done, the, uh, the, the Prevention and, and Control Deforestation Plan, we have seen uh, a significant drop in deforestation. I would say that Brazil was the country that mostly uh, contribute to climate mitigation uh, in the planet, we were able to mitigate five gigatons of emissions by reducing deforestation on those years. And that's when Brazil also brought a very innovative mechanism to fundraise uh, transitioning from traditional ODA that used to finance projects and actually approve and, and, and have a, the donors having a say to what they believe would, they would, would be the appropriate project to be financed to reverse this logic and actually uh, pay, starting to start to pay for results. So in COP15 in Bali, Brazil presented a, an innovative instrument called the Amazon Fund that, had what, that provided this idea. I have reduced deforestation since 20, 2004, and I have relevant goals and targets to continue doing all this process and the, and the investment of my own budget and the, the investment of my own society to commit to the right actions but I'm contributing also to the planet and to, to, to mitigate global warming. So, and because of all the historical uh, uh, responsibility, uh, I need to be rewarded and paid for these results. So that was the logic of the Amazon Fund that at the end was consolidated and approved in the Varso framework for RED and later on ratified in the Paris Agreement. But still, if we go back to the five gig gigatons of, of, of carbon emissions that Brazil avoided and valuing it by the five dollars, uh, Professor Alexandre, that the Amazon fund considered to, have, to value each ton of carbon uh, avoided, Brazil would be eligible to receive more than 25 billion dollars. Of, of payment for results. And the Amazon Fund, although it, was the, it is still the biggest Red Plus instrument so far in terms of size of funding, it was able to raise less than 5%, $1.3 billion. So still we have an economic issue on the table and we need to see, to really go from commitments to to, to investment, uh, uh, really. So that's when the Leaf Coalition emerged in the discussion that uh, should we uh, only consider funding coming from uh, uh, bilateral, multilateral agreements among countries, or should we bring the private sector also and sensibilize these corporates that are now committing with the, in their SESG uh, 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 social and, and, and environmental responsibilities, and also uh, looking for the voluntary common market more attentively attentively and eventually considering by going beyond their, their net zero commitments in their own value chains and channel funds to forest protection. So that's when in 2020 the LEAF coalition uh, was created with countries that historically had cooperated with forest uh, protection. So the, the in the coalition we have Norway, we have UK, you have US government and re more recently South Korea and more than 25 global corporation, corporations that First and foremost, to become a member of a coalition, they have to have uh, clear commitments in decarbonizing their own value chains with net zero commitments to, to half of the century, adhering to the UN race to zero, uh, having transparent mechanism to, to, to communicate their, uh, their, uh, the, the meeting of their goals. Uh, so, and then 
commit a minimum uh, investment to uh, to forest protection. And then all these uh, uh, public-private partners jointly commit to channel funds to those countries who are subnational governments that prove, based on their own uh, 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 MRV systems, that they reduce uh, deforestation, that they respected uh, social and environmental safeguards. That is also part of the agreement uh, under the UN, uh, 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 as we know, the Cancun safeguards, an important uh, agreement that uh, had uh, like a long uh, process of consultation. Uh, and, and so if these countries prove that they reduce deforestation uh, with their own MRV systems and they, they respected social and environmental safeguards, they are eligible to receive funding from, from the coalition. So that's the idea of trying really to bring a new actor that was never on the table or thinking about forests and eventually, and as we know, the most uh, the, the emissions come mostly from, from fossil fuel and, and, and that there is, a, there is a much more attention to the transition to renewables than the look for forests. But considering the recent IPP, IPCC reports, uh, that clearly says that without forests, we will not reach the the commit the the limits of 1.5 Celsius. Uh, 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 that there is this uh, acknowledgement coming from the corporates that uh, they they might contribute to forest protection as well. So I will stop here, Professor. But uh, that's the that's the background of the creation of the coalition. Uh, and in summary, is to bring this new actor that was not ever in the table, considering channeling funds to forest protection. Excellent. Uh, so red plus came up, which I believe is your cue, Kevin. But before I can let you speak, I have to mention, you're not just the executive director of the Coalition for Rainforest Nations, you are also a 2005 CBS graduate, LBS as well, but CBS especially. Uh, so Kevin, Connor. Hello, hello. Hey guys, it's good to be back at Columbia Business School. I grew up in Papua New Guinea. I grew up deep in the rainforest, and learned a lot of things. Um, one of which is that it's very difficult to deforest, as we were talking about. Um, a few people with a machete don't get very far. You need, you need commitment to destroy forests, huge machinery, etc. The other thing I learned was that most indigenous communities don't support any of that. They actually value their rainforest. The rainforests are their refrigerator, their, their kitchen, their bedding, and, and create, sustain them. The only reason they allow these people in is either they're coming in illegally or there's some type of revenue share where they think they're going to advance as a result of that. So they'll promise to build a road or a health center or whatever it is that the community wants and they'll basically destroy their natural legacy. So growing up in Papua New Guinea, the key was how do we provide an incentive for the ecosystem services of those rainforests? And it, it became my thesis here at Columbia Business School. And my thesis advisor was Professor Heal sitting uh, over here. And we decided, my background is finance. Uh, worked at Solomon Brothers back when they existed uh, before I came to Columbia Business School. If we were going to tip the balance, we needed to create a global asset class that could be institutionalized in the financial systems to try to change the market failures that were largely causing deforestation. My first trip to the UNFCC, I met Andre. This was, uh, I think, uh, May 2005. I presented on, path, on behalf of Papua New Guinea that, that deforestation was a major source of emissions. Brazil was largely responsible for kicking the uh, emissions from deforestation out of the Kyoto Protocol. And I was trying to put it back uh, into climate negotiations. And Andre and I spent a very long evening trying to reframe this to a system of positive incentives. And we had Miguez, 
we had a bunch of the scientists and we spent a long time. And I have to give credit to Brazil. After we sort of had a meeting of the minds, we were able to push a new structure for positive incentives for countries that wanted to reduce emissions. And it's been successful. As we sit today, about 95% of the world's rainforests are part of the Red Plus mechanism under the UNFCC. Largely led by Brazil, about 13 gigatons of emission reductions, so 13 billion tons of emission reductions. At the same time, we've mobilized since that time about $18 billion. Now, Andre and I could pat each other on the back and say we accomplished something, but the fact of the matter is there's so much more to be done. Even though if you look at emissions and, and forest loss, since 2005, when we started this mechanism, they have trended downwards. Developing countries have been slowing deforestation, even though you'll see a lot of media otherwise. The tool is working. So now you, now you think, what levers do we pull? So we have a global problem with regard to climate and biodiversity. We are failing as society on a massive scale and with increasing pace. I'm generally a free market guy, but when it comes to social problems and trying to use markets to solve social problems, we have to think regulation. Voluntary efforts aren't getting the job done. Let's talk about that briefly. For 20 years, we've been hearing about voluntary markets. After 20 years of talking about voluntary markets and relying on companies to voluntarily reduce emissions and voluntarily give credits, last year they, were, they contributed about $1.5 billion, but they're less than 1% of, they're covering less than 1% of global emissions. At the same time, if you look at compliance, governments that are starting to actually regulate emissions, they're already up to over 20%. So, in the next seven years that we have, to try to keep 1.5 alive, do we pull volunta the voluntary lever and hope we can scale it by 100 and maybe get to 80%, or do we pull the policy lever that Brazil has pioneered and actually start instituting policies and legislation and actions to slow deforestation? So, We've got to scale up the incentives and we've got to scale up the regulation if we're going to solve both climate and biodiversity challenges that we have before us. Can I probe a bit more? What are, the, what are these policies? Where are they being passed? Or what, what are the specific... Right, it's Brazil on the one hand, of course. Um, what is the EU doing? What should the EU be doing? Not even asking about the U.S. at the federal level right now, but that's a different topic. Um, what are some of these, what are the most important key levers here? I've been talking, so I want to give it to Andre. Uh, it's uh, very, very difficult to get financial support. It's, uh, it's really very impressive, and I completely agree with, uh, with what Kevin said, because uh, the voluntary market, there are some people that are so optimistic about it, but the numbers uh, are, are incredibly modest. Uh, and what I like about what was presented today is that you can see that um, with a certain effort, you can find a way of really valuing this in a way that works and should be somehow mandatory and should be somehow uh, um, uh, something that uh, the, the developed countries should uh, promote. Uh, and, and I think it's very interesting because um, in your presentation, uh, uh, José, you, you mentioned that you didn't even take into consideration the other benefits. We're only talking about carbon. And the other be benefits, if you add to it, uh, then it's a, a really beautiful story, but we have to uh, to have a new narrative. We have to have a new economic logic, and I think that we all here are quite close in trying that. The leaf uh, issue 
uh, is a complex issue uh, for for developing countries, um, uh, and Kevin can can uh, continue what I say probably, uh, because it is somehow again a top down thing. You know, it's uh, how we want to spend the money in the developing country and not what the developing countries uh, think they can do and they would like to get money for. But this is a a long, uh, a long debate, and at the end, as Kevin said, we were in complete disagreement at some moment in the convention, and we ended up finding something because we have to to sit together. I'm very constructive nowadays. You see, it's, it's very impressive. Diana, hello. I have a comment, and actually, uh, even a question, Ambassador, and I will comment on leaf, but. It's more uh, before, uh, more related to your previous comment and also what Kevin just said. I think, and ideally, I think we should uh, consider moving to a regulated carbon market. And I think, in some sense, uh, Brazil is doing is 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 going through this path with the bill of law that is now uh, under the Senate to be approved and to have a cap and trade system inside the 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 country. But in the same time, if we consider the potential of fundraising internationally to the country, and we are thinking, we are speaking here about uh, uh, emission reductions coming from forests, and 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 we all know that the Brazilian NDC stands a lot in in results coming from land use. So we like we have like very challenging t goals to reduce deforestation and also very aggressive uh, targets to, in terms of restoration. Uh, so I would say that in the short term, we would not have, uh, uh, we would not be able to consider corresponding adjustments uh, in, the, in, the tr in any transaction that we do internationally. And that's when the voluntary carbon market might play a role because there is a window of opportunity while we still are not considering, hopefully we will have a, 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 we will exceed our NDC and we will be able to consider corresponding adjustment in the future and, and hopefully, and I hope it will with premium prices because we are doing more than we committed, but while we do not reach that, that moment, if we close the door to the voluntary carbon market, we will not be able to transact our emission reductions uh, with uh, globally. We will be limited to the, cap to the national cap and trade. So that's one thing I want really to reflect of how we can really take the opportunity, and I'm speaking specifically about Brazil because they might, I, I'm a public uh, implementer, uh, and, and, and by the way, I was uh, the lead of the Amazon Fund for six years until the end of 2018. So uh, uh, that's, that's why I believe that eventually bringing funding from these corporates that have a, a high bar in terms of their own uh, decarbonization commitments. So they have to decarbonize in the three scopes. They have to adhere to UN race to zero. They have to, 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 to have goals that are adhering to SBTI or other high standard. They have to transparently communicate. And in addition to that, eventually going, uh, channeling funds voluntarily, I, I completely agree that 1.5 billion is nothing. But it, it has been nothing, even in bilateral commitments. We are, again, the Amazon Fund was able, uh, and it's a success to have been able to, to raise 1.3 billion, but it's not enough to what we have delivered. So we have to find ways to really value standing forest uh, rather than uh, uh, closing the, the door or trying to be innovative in this process. In terms of the, in, in, in your last comment, in terms of the top-down uh, approach, I, I understand the perspective because I am also Brazilian and I, I'm very connected in, in, uh, to, the, to the historical position of the Itamaraty, our Minister of Environment of the country ownership. But I do believe that the LEAF coalition in some sense replicates the model of the Amazon Fund because they do not interfere in in, in public policies that are being implemented to reduce deforestation, they do not interfere where the funding that will be, will be paid for this result will be a, uh, 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 a channel to. So the governance, the decision-making process, the, public, the prioritization of public, for, 
policies of where these money that eventually will be paid by corporates, by sovereign countries that are also part of the coalition, uh, is a decision of the country, the forest country, the LEAF coalition, do not interfere where the funding will be Will be, will be used. So it really replicates the model of the Amazon Fund that has a commission for uh, to uh, a guiding a steering committee uh, committee, the COFA, that decides the priorities. The Brazil receives the payment for results, but it's it's a national multiple uh, multi stakeholder commission that decides where the funding is going. And BNDS, as the Brazilian Development Bank, is the 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 manager of the fund. So the the model is exactly the same. I would say that the difference is one: we have the private sector as the funder, and two, uh, we there is one. Dif difference that maybe is part of our discussion here. We, the, the, the corporates rely in an independent certifier that is art. Uh, so it's a parallel registry that will uh, provide uh, insurance that the credits that are being bought are at high integrity, they are fungible. Uh, uh, so uh, the, the, the corporates can compare a credit that is purchased from Brazil to a credit that's purchased from uh, the Republic of Congo, from Costa Rica, and etc. So that's, I would say, the two main differences. Uh, and in addition, of course, we are in the voluntary carbon market, and that's why the certifier come into place. Juliano has his, had his hand up. And Oh, yep. and, no, ju ju just to, we'll to, to make a quick, to... a, a quick comment on, on on the economics of the Amazon, which is the title of this of this whole session. I think it's important to, to, to have in mind what Elena and Jose presented about the importance, the scale, and the fact that uh, dealing with the forest is not only stopping the damage, it's not only stopping deforestation, but there is a a, a real rationale about forest restoration at scale that will save the integrity of the forest and also can provide for the climate agenda a relatively cheap way uh, of carbon capture at, at scale. So I think the homework is much beyond than, you know, stop deforestation, stop the damage, but rather to how can we rely on forests as part of the climate solution, right? Kevin? Yeah, I, I, I don't want to get into a long discussion on all the flaws of LEAF or all the flaws of uh, Vera or any of those uh, those things. The fact of the matter is we're facing a dire situation when it comes to biodiversity and climate and we have to unify around a common way to account for these. And the alphabet soup of standards is actually distracting and slowing implementation. LEAF has different requirements, then does the UNFCC, then does VERA, then does whatever. So if you're a country with low capacity, you can't implement under the Paris Agreement and implement under a different standard and under a different standard, etc. It's time to streamline. And 196 countries under the Paris Agreement have agreed on a global carbon accounting standard. They've agreed on methodologies for carbon so that it's apples to apples. So you can't transfer a credit from one economy using one standard and expect it to be credited in another economy using a different standard. We need speed. We need scale. We need simplicity. Otherwise, we're going to fail. And, th and this right now is, I, I think, our, our challenge. And just to, to come on the positive side of LEAF, because I'm not criticizing LEAF as a whole, uh, is that LEAF was created at the moment uh, that the Bolsonaro government had paralyzed the, the, uh, the Amazon fund. So uh, that was a, a very positive uh, um, initiative uh, because it was paralyzed. Uh, now that the government, the new government, is re establishing the Amazon Fund and strengthening the Amazon Fund and proposing some countries, including the United States, has committed to 500 million uh, to the Amazon Fund. Yeah, he's laughing, but, <laughs> uh, but the, 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 the fact is that we want to come back to the Amazon Fund. Why LEAF if we have the Amazon Fund, which was created in the logic of the UNFCCC, in the logic of, uh, sort of, yeah, uh, but quite close. Uh, so closer than the other one, uh, but uh, uh, 
but the fact is that uh, um, uh, we we have to try to 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 really have a uniform capacity of interpreting what are uh, the emissions, what are not the emissions, what is the standard of uh, what is done. And I want to stress here something that uh, <clears throat> Juliano was mentioning. It's very different restoration from preservation. So uh, I think that we have uh, to find different logics for the two. And I think this is the great contribution of today, is that uh, restoration has much more uh, potential than was thought before. Uh, and I think this is the great news about what, yeah, cheap and effective and can be effective. And then preservation is another logic that I think that we have to work on. I hope some of you will have brilliant ideas about that that we can adopt. But we still have not a logic for preservation. And preservation includes biodiversity, includes all these other uh, uh, benefits uh, that we beyond carbon that we have been completely unable to uh, give a decent price until now. Yeah, speaking about the Amazon Fund, one minute, uh, very quickly. Yeah. The Amazon Fund, uh, very quickly. The Amazon Fund uh, ambassador. I completely agree with you that the Amazon Fund must be the instrument in Brazil to advance and to fundraise. The point is that the Amazon Fund is not ready at this moment, and this is something we need to address internally uh, to bring this new actor of the private sector. And the Leaf Coalition, when we engage, and I engage, I'm responsible for engaging with Brazil, the funding that will eventually go to Brazil through Leaf will not come from the sovereign countries that has already committed to the Amazon fund. The funding that eventually will be channeled to Brazil will come from the private sector that is not going to the Amazon fund. And the question and the solution we have to, to face, Kevin, uh, is how to attract these corporates at this window of opportunity, as I said before, to agree that the UNFCCC process uh, is sufficient enough for their requirements in terms of claims and fungibility. That's why the corporates rely on an independent certifier like VEHA or like uh, uh, ART, but that's, that's how the market is responding uh, and, and that we eventually need to, to see how this gets transformed. <laughs> This is fun and we can clearly keep going um, all day. Let me just remind you of my commitment. So 7.45 reception, which leaves us 20 minutes for questions and there must be questions. You have a mic. Two questions, okay, two short questions. Is, and maybe I, I'm before, gonna be very short. quick reminder, questions end with a question mark <laughs> and a one sentence. My name is Marianne. <laughs> so I have two one for uh, Professor José is like the price when you're talking about the price for carbon. So you're considering an average of twenty dollars for both uh, avoiding deforestation and promoting restoration. Because what we see right now is just like different costs completely, and that's one one of the questions. And the other one, I think, is for the whole panel. So one, of, I work with the uh, large scale restoration, and one of the things that a lot of uh, companies and actors actually challenges is the fact is permanence. So after we store an area, how to ensure permanence. And one of the things that we've been seeing is just like when you compare restoration with, for example, carbon removal geoengineering, all the regulations like the governments have been assuming and taking all the costs for the permanence. So after 30 years, for example, that's in the bill, the Brazilian bill, for example, for CCS right now, the government is responsible for the area after 30 years. And that actually shifts a lot of the costs towards permanence. So my question is like, how can we take this into account both in terms of regulation, but also for the cost, if that shifts the costs or the carbon price when you're taking the $20, for example, for uh, promoting restoration? So uh, the answer is simple. We are just, in our model, you're just getting paid for actual carbon capture, okay, not for preservation. Preservation is like a plus. The preservation is are the what you get because you're not going to go into the path that we seem to be going now. We, you don't get paid for that. You get paid twenty dollars per ton that you actually capture. That's what Julian was saying. It's a different logic, the logic of using the forest to capture carbon, to reduce carbon in the atmosphere. 
And what this work shows is that that's both economically feasible and quantitatively important. So the forest could play a big role on carbon, on diminishing the, 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 the quantity of CO2 in the atmosphere. Talking about permanence, it's it's an important issue, but it's now a little bit of a red herring under the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement requires you, once you put a sector into your NDC, you can never take it out. So you're going to have to keep reporting every five years on all your forest assets. And if they change, if there's a lack of permanence and they disappear, that has to be reflected in your national greenhouse gas inventory, and it has to be in your biennial transparency report. And so permanence gets picked up. And imagine it like a bank account. If something disappears, you, you have to restore it before you get credit again. You're, you're in deficit. So permanence gets picked up by, by continual reporting. And, that, and, and that's what the Paris Agreement is designed to do. So every five years, you have to update your end. Well, we're going to have a global stock take uh, at the COP coming up. The global stock take is saying, Earth, we have a problem. All your NDCs don't have enough ambition. Tighten up your NDCs. But now for the next 30 to 40 years, every country is going to have to report on all every tree in its economy. It's going to have to report on every source of emissions, and it's going to have to be reducing those. And the Paris Agreement counts only reductions and removals. And if you think, I'll just say this once, if you think about climate stability, that means that emissions and removals have to be in balance. And in 2050, if you want to emit, you're going to have to be paired with a removal. That's climate balance. And so it's going to change the value proposition for countries that are net removers, and Brazil is one of them. Back left. Yeah. Hi. Um, hello. Thank you very much. I'm Rocio Peña. I'm, doing, I'm currently doing my MBA here at CVS. Um, I'm Mexican, and I want, I mean, even... It's a very different problem. I, I do think that Latin America faces kind of like a similar situation. And I was wondering in terms, I, I do agree entirely that this is a problem that needs severe regulation from the governments because, yes, the, the capital markets can contribute significantly, but it's an implementation problem. And I wanted to ask regarding this point of implementation, I do think that it goes hand in hand with social pro social programs and social problems within the regions of the Amazons or their brain, where their rainforests are. So I wanted to ask around that: what are what like, if the current administration in Brazil is formulating a social agenda that involves? Like I just want to know more about how is a is a government thinking on integrating the social, like the community, into fixing this problem, because I agree, the people who live around the Amazon is, is going to be, are the most affected, and I want to, and I'm sure they are also the more interested in having this problem fixed as soon as possible. So I wanted to know what's the agenda of the current government to building these social programs, or um, basically how are all these billions of dollars of funds going to be working. Yeah. Ambassador. Well, ver very quickly, uh, because uh, we're doing many things. As you know, the Lula government uh, has much more focus on the social than on the other dimensions. Uh, and, uh, and in the Amazon, as was mentioned here, uh, there are uh, people that uh, you have uh, indigenous, low, uh, original indigenous people, you have uh, uh, a series of other uh, inhabitants of the forest that, uh, that uh, have very legitimate uh, uh, activities and that have been preserving uh, the forest uh, by uh, kinds of activities that are perfectly coherent with the logic of the forest. Then you have those who arrived later. Then you have one very big issue that um, Juliano mentioned, 
which is reforma agraria, how do you say, um, land, uh, uh, land reform. Land reform settlers, that was, is one of the main reasons of deforestation in Brazil. So it's a very positive policy from a social point of view and has been uh, very, uh, had a very strong impact on deforestation. Uh, and then you have the illegal activities. It was a very good idea and a very important attempt, but hasn't worked out. And the good news is that last week, uh, the president launched a program that now all these land uh, distribution will happen uh, in areas that were already uh, uh, deforested. So uh, there is not going to be additional occupation of land. So there are many things that are happening. But I, I want to stress something that I believe is, is, is really uh, something we sometimes forget. Most of the statistics on the Amazon uh, are about what we call legal Amazon. Legal Amazon is a concept of the 50s to stimulate the destruction of the Amazon. It was a tax exemption if you would go there and cut everything as much as you can, etc. So legal Amazon is like a much larger area than the biome. So the legal Amazon has around 29 million people, uh, as Juliana said. Uh, but if you take the biome, uh, the biome in Brazil, and it's 60% of the Amazon, the biome in Brazil has less than 15 million people. Of these 15 million people, 10 million live in cities of more than 70,000 inhabitants. So one policy that is essential for uh, the social uh, balance in the Amazon is investments in cities. This is an extremely important dimension. Then you have five million people left in a territory that is larger than entire India, because the biome Amazon in Brazil is larger than entire India. So there must be economic solutions for that. And it's not that you have to compensate uh, tens of millions of people. You have to work on that uh, on a reasonably uh, uh, reduced number of people. Now, the other thing that you have to, 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 to separate, I think, is illegality and crime. It's completely different to have a person that gets a piece of land and uses a piece of land uh, and is a nice guy and he's just trying to live decently and the other guy that is an illegal miner that enters into Yanomani territory and that kills five Yanomami. This is crime. This is completely different. So we also have to distinguish very clearly uh, that there are completely different kinds of uh, gravity uh, of activities in the Amazon. And I believe we are also progressing in that sense. Question right here. Hello, hi everyone. My name is Manuela. Um, I finished my, my program at CIPA, not CPS. Um, my question is going to reference a little bit of the article, but the question can be answered by anyone, actually. So um, I understand, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but a, pr a project of reforestation takes years, at least seven years, to generate the capacity, the potential to um, capture carbon, right? So this is, let's say that takes seven years. Um, a person that is living there in that community that uh, the land is deforested, they need the money right now. They need the 20 bucks right now, right? So how do you close the gap between what the people there need the money right now, the investment required to make that forest uh, as the same as the biome of the region, right? So it has an investment, it has a money, it has costs attached to it, and the risks of a private uh, agent investing in this project, right? Because you have, so you have, you have to have the money for the people up down there, you have to have the first investment, and you have the risk, for example, in Brazil, of changing the, the government again, and we have a crazy Bolsonaro again. So um, how, how do we close that gap, and how we make sure that this is a project that investors can invest and will have the returns um, in the future? Thank you. So. Hold that thought. Sorry, I'm up here. <laughs> One more question, and then back to the panel for final answers, closing statements, reception. 
Thank you so much for being here. My, my name is Mateo. I'm from Colombia, former student here at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia. Uh, this week, The Guardian published another article on carbon markets and questioning carbon markets. Uh, whether the methodology that they are using is valid or not, the truth it is that there is a cloud in carbon markets. So I, I wanted to ask Juliana, from your perspective, if, if do you see this as an opportunity or a challenge from the demand side, and especially uh, taking into account the jurisdictional red plus credits of the LEAF coalition? And to Kevin, I wanted to ask you, how do you see uh, that we can make corporations and also governments that are polluting and that have a major responsibility in the climate crisis to pay, to pay the fair share? Thank you. Shall we start with the second question quickly first and then, okay. Well. Uh, I think the, the, the Guardian article and the scrutiny that Verha has gone through, in some sense, it was necessary because we've been seeing in the Amazon, uh, and not necessarily, I do not, I'm, do, do, I'm not speaking specifically about the assessment that, that the, the, the journalist has made to the projects or to Verha itself, but it's more about the, the, the good and the bad players in the carbon agenda. And as you just said, in Brazil in particular, and I know in Colombia as well, uh, there, are, there are a lot of carbon cowboys actually are arresting local communities, bribing leaders to have them sign an English contract and, and basically uh, transferring rights for carbon exploration. So there is a need in the volunt voluntary carbon market does not mean that it's completely out of governance. It needs minimum governance, it needs public policy, it needs uh, some oversight from, uh, uh, from a public, public sector because we need to avoid carbon grabbing. That's, the, that's, that's a new way of land grabbing, it's carbon grabbing. So at the project level, we see, I see many risks. Leakage is another risk at the carbon uh, uh, level projects. You should not uh, uh, accept that you have islands of conservation while the forests around those projects are burning and getting deforested. So we need, of course, there, is, there are methodologies and ways to nest good projects into a jurisdictional model. So the LEAF coalition has opted to go to the jurisdictional model because it looks for the territory. It looks for like the results and it's not preservation, it's results. Uh, emission reductions that happen that was measured, for example, in Brazil by INPE and the, the rates compared to historical uh, uh, data. So that's the point that I think it's the, the chance to, to, to set the right uh, framework for the carbon market. Kevin. So, voluntary markets, LEAF, they're going to die. They have to. They have to. The fact of the matter is, every country has agreed to NDCs, They've agreed to transfer credits under a system called ITMOS in Article 6.2. And as countries implement their NDCs, the voluntary nature of emission reductions is going to disappear. It's going to become compliance. Otherwise, you cannot get serious emission reductions. And the, the next point of that is if a country is failing its NDC, is it gonna take taxpayers' money and give it to Brazil to be in compliance? No. It's gonna put that pressure on its corporations. It's gonna say, you guys have to either reduce emissions or you're gonna to have to buy ITMOs for us to meet our NDC. So you're gonna start seeing, you're going to, and Singapore is already doing this. Pay a tax, buy an ITMO in order to meet your requirement. So you're going to see as, as NDCs tighten up, the whole voluntary nature and all these alphabet soup systems outside of the Paris Agreement are necessarily going to disappear. 
Giuliani, you promised me two seconds. You just said, I don't know. But we are down to four panelists, four minutes. Giuliani. Okay. No, just to answer your question, I think uh, the simulations that Jose showed, they are all relying on natural forest restoration. So there is no investment required. You just, you know, abandon the lands and then the forest do uh, what's been doing. So in the Amazon nowadays, we have 10 million hectares of natural forest restoration. So it's a huge potential there. Also, economics has a magic to compare payoffs in different periods. It's called the discount rate. So everything is discounted. So you can think of it all as dollars today. You know, pay as, as, as go, right? As you are, the, the, the thing that you have in mind is that every single year you compute the amount of carbon that you capture and you do the, uh, the amount of capture that you emit from the first station, then you get the, the payment out of it. Yeah, 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 but in, and actually the forest restoration, the, the, the trajectory is more favorable than, than you, uh, you would imagine. It's, it's, it's more front. Ambassador, or maybe Eleanor is the natural scientist on this panel. Hello. I think it's going to be a hard problem with many approaches, and some of them would fail, and I hope many succeed. And it's not going to be one. I'm sure it's going to be regulation, voluntary markets, NGOs, some scientific solutions. And I'm sure people on the ground are going to do their best job under this government and hopefully next government, right? But one thing I want to just stress out, people often think about trade-off. It's like global carbon versus local forest. I think the problem is that climate is not just a global problem. It's a global and a local problem. And if people who you know, manage forests or live off the land, they need to understand if they deforest, it's not just they're going to make everybody else worse off. They're going to make themselves worse off because they're going to be climate changes locally. Climate is not just a global phenomena. And I think that might affect the prices of electricity, prices of the food, you know, also fires. Like, look at what happened in uh, Hawaii, right? Just changes in the local landscape produces catastrophic events. So hopefully politicians in Brazil and abroad think not just about what are the, you know, cost of social cost of carbon or the cost of, you know, rebuilding or foresting, but what are going to be overall broader societal impacts and catastrophic risks if Amazon is not preserved? Because it's not just about carbon. Thank you. And before we thank the panel, let me just say we do have a reception thanks to the Tema Center on the third floor boardrooms. There are elevators. There are also stairs, especially for the ones in the back, one floor up. Um, thank you very much. I'm sure we'll continue the conversation upstairs.